Hey guys, today we're going to be talking about soldering. I'm going to go over a few basics to get people started. We're going to talk about soldering to the pads on a circuit board, soldering to terminals on components, and then splicing two wires together. You can see I have a profi board here. Any board is going to be the same principle as what I'm going to show. This just happens to be what I have on hand. When you solder to a board, you do not want power connected, so get rid of your battery. If the board's fresh, that's easy. If you're working on a board that's in progress, don't have power connected to it while you're soldering. The second thing you don't want when you're soldering, the SD card inserted in the board. Take it out, put it aside. Now let's move on to what we need to do to this board to get it ready to solder. Now, some people like to clean the pads on the board. I don't always do it, but the point of doing it is to remove any oxidation or residue that might be on the pads. So take a Q-tip, dip it in isopropyl alcohol, and then just gently rub down the pads. And you'll see that I'm using alligator clips here on these coolant hoses as helping hands. And this little clip is inside of the alligator clip and it's actually off of the name tag. And it works really well for holding a board because it has a larger surface area and it has flat jaws that aren't serrated. You'll see when I clamp, I'm not clamping on top of any of these components here. I'm clamping on the pad area, which is all flat. The reason for that is these little components have delicate connections. And if you clamp on top of them, it's very easy to tear them off of the board. So now that we have the pads cleaned, let's move on to prepping the wire. So the first step to prepping wire, you cut it to your length, and then you need to strip the end of it. You can either use wire strippers or a hoppy blade or X-Acto knife. For a long time, I used an X-Acto knife. I didn't have wire strippers, so show you how I go about that. You want to take the wire, think about roughly how much conductor you want exposed, place it underneath of the blade with light pressure, and then spin the wire back and forth until you have cut through that outer layer of conductor. You don't want to cut too far in. Always go a little bit less than what you think. And then you can just peel the insulation off. And you'll see that now I have conductor exposed on the end there. And I can see that I haven't cut through any of the strands in that conductor. If you cut too far through, whether with wire strippers or with a knife, you need to trim off the end and start again. If the wire is missing strands, it's going to carry less current. It's going to have a buildup of resistance in it that you don't want and or those little strands of wire can fall off on your components or your board and cause a short circuit somewhere. With wire strippers, it's going to be a similar process. You simply find the corresponding number to your wire gauge. Occasionally, you'll need to use a size down or a size up. Um, oftentimes, I find with the PTFE insulation that I use, I need to size down. So this 28 gauge wire that I'm using, I actually use the the 30 gauge on here. And then I'll just wiggle it back and forth and let the blade do its work. And it'll peel that insulation right off. Now that I've got those wires stripped, I need to pre-tin them. And pre-tinning is just putting solder onto the wire or a component prior to making your solder joint. So I clean the tip of my soldering iron. I have my iron set at 340 degrees Celsius which is 644 degrees Fahrenheit. I like to solder there. Um, anywhere around 350 is pretty typical. Some people like to solder all the way down at 300. Some people like to solder all the way up at 400. 400 seems a little hot to me and 300 seems a little cool. So I like to get right in between the two. So I'll get a little bit of solder on the tip of my iron and then I will place the iron and the solder to the wire and the wire sucks up that solder. And now I'll do the same thing with the other wire. 
Okay, now let's pretend the pads on the board. So my pads are clean. I can either put flux onto a pad or I can solder directly to the pad without adding flux. And so I'll do both to show you what those methods look like. So again, adding a little bit of solder to the tip of my iron. I'm gonna work down here on the left corner pad. I'm going to apply the iron to heat the pad and apply solder. And that solder wicks to that pad and makes a nice little dome. You want to apply the iron for as little time as possible. So if you aren't experienced yet and it takes you a little bit to get a good bead of solder laid on to your board for pre-tinning those pads, try it. If you don't get that solder properly beading on there, take the tip away, let the board cool down. Once that pad's cooled, you can go back for another attempt. One other thing to keep in mind is that if your solder looks gray, a dull gray color, or if it's not taking to the pad, or if it's sticking to your iron as you pull your iron away, this is likely because you have burned all the flux out of the solder. All you need to do is add a little bit more flux. If you have paste, or if you have it in syringe form, put a little bit of that flux on top of your solder or on that pad, and then come back in with the iron cleaned and tinned and touch it to that pad. The solder should suck that flux in and turn shiny, and then you'll be able to make a good joint with it. Now I'll show using flux. Flux helps your solder to flow better and it keeps it from oxidizing. You don't need much. I like to use a little cup of solder paste and a shave down toothpick, and I just get a little bit on the end of that toothpick. Then I go to the pad that I want to add flux to, and I wipe just a thin little layer on that pad and on that pad only. You do not want to get it around the pad or onto another pad because wherever you put that flux, the solder is going to flow. And again, just getting a little bit of solder on the tip of my iron and then applying to the pad. Now you'll note the difference is minimal between those two methods. If you have a good solder wire, especially. So now with the two pads pretend and my wires pretend, let's look at the next step. You can see on this wire, I have solder running all the way up to the insulation. You can't see any individual strands, and that's important. You don't want your, your strands to be separated. You want them to be completely coated in solder, but you don't want the solder globbed on there. The next most important part is trimming that exposed conductor to the same or shorter length than the size of the pad you're soldering to. I can see there that I'm gonna to need to take more than half of the available conductor. So I'll trim that and take a look at it. And I think it can take a little bit more off. I like having mine fairly short, so I'm gonna trim it here more. Okay, now you can see that this exposed conductor is actually slightly shorter than that pad. The advantage to that is the conductor is only over the pad. You don't have any bare wire extending past the pad or the board. You'll also notice that I pre tin these pads rather than putting the wire through the hole, and that's called a through hole connection. I prefer to do a surface mount, and surface mount is good for a couple of reasons. One, surface mounting keeps your installation cleaner. All of your wires are laying down flat with the length of the board instead of standing up and taking up extra space inside the hilt. The other advantage is that there is less stress on the joint. If you have a properly trimmed wire, if it's pre-tinned all the way to your insulation, and then you put that over the pad and solder it surface mount rather than through the hole, you're going to see a lot better results. I'm going to add a little bit of solder to the tip of my iron. And then I'm going to come up here, make that connection. I've got a nice shiny little dome of solder. And you can see that that wire is not going anywhere.
if your solder is not shiny, it means that you have taken a lot of the flux out of it or all of the flux out of it. When the flux leaves the solder, it gets a dull look. This is nice and shiny. Moving on to soldering to components. You can see I have a switchable power jack here. It has three terminals on it. And those terminals are pretty long. They're gonna take up space in your installation and it's just not necessary to have that large of a space for connection in our case. So let's trim those down. I'm gonna trim them down to a usable but extremely small connector. relative to their original size. Okay. It's not, it takes considerably less space. Gravity is at play when you're soldering things like this. So what I mean by that is the easiest way to see what you're doing when you're soldering this would be to place it like that. So your terminals are facing upward and you can go around and solder to each of them. But if you do that, there's a possibility that solder will run down the side of this terminal and bridge the connection between that terminal and another terminal because they all are seated on top of one another here. So what I do instead is I face them at a 45 degree angle. In other words, I don't face it down. I don't face it upward. I don't face it towards me. I turn it between facing at me and facing downward. So that's our 90 degrees right in between is 45 degrees. That way, gravity causes the solder to run down and it's not going, it's, it's less likely to work its way up onto another contact. If you were good at pre-tinning, you have your settings right, you have a good tip on your iron, you have good solder, it's no problem to come up here and just flow solder onto these contacts. But it can help to add flux, so if you find that it's not, the solder is not taking to the contact, just add a little bit of flux on top of it. So those contacts are all pre-tinned. Now I'll come in with the wires that I pre-tinned and show you what it looks like to solder this joint. Now you'll see that this wire is a little bit long for that contact. So just like on the board, I'm gonna keep this nice and tidy to trim that wire down. Be mindful of where you want to face your wires in your installation. So I'm going to face this at a 90 degree angle going away from the joint. And you can see I have a good solder joint there. The wire is not all the way flush with the pad. It is a good joint, but my pickiness, I would probably redo that. It's a little bit difficult to look through the camera and do this, but you guys get the general idea. Again, this guy's a little bit long. I'm gonna trim him down. And that joint, in my opinion, is much better. I have the wire flush against the contact and just enough solder to dome over the top of it. And it's nice and shiny. So when you're working on components like this, those joints are going to see a little bit of movement occasionally when you're sliding other things in and out of your hilt. So pretend that you have this wire coiled up in the hilt and you have a chassis connected to it. Or just pretend that this is a switch or something that is hard connected to your hilt, but you have a battery pack or something of that nature that you slide in and out of the hilt to access it. This wire is going to move like this. And eventually that connection may break right there at the joint. A good way to reinforce it is to bring in heat shrink and then just run that heat shrink up over the end of that contact to where it covers it. And once you have it pressed into place, you just need to apply heat to it. You can use your soldering iron by bringing it close or just skimming the surface of the heat shrink. You can use a torch or a torch style lighter like this and it will shrink it down. A standard Bic style lighter will work as well. Just don't keep it on the shrink for long or it'll melt or burn it. 
and if you are lucky enough to have um, a hot air station, then that works extremely well. Once that heat shrink is tight on your wire and your joint, it reduces the movement. All right, and now let's move on to splicing two wires together. So I have these larger wires so it's easier for you to see what's happening. The first step is to splay out the strands on both wires. Once you've done that, you take the wires and you mesh those strands together and then fold them down. And it's important that you strip each of these to the same length. That way the strands are not overlapping your insulation. And then gently twist those strands. Once you have them twisted together, you can put one end in your helping hands. I recommend not putting the other end in as it can sometimes pull that joint apart. If you want to, you can also add flux to these wires. I'm not going to, I don't feel that I need it. I'm just gonna pretend the tip of my soldering iron and then allow that solder to soak into that connection. I like to make sure that those wires are fully coated throughout. Once you have a good shiny joint like that, it's not going to come apart. You can cover it with heat shrink. And when you install inside of a saber, keep in mind, you've now spliced these wires together. If the other ends are both connected to components, you can't put the heat shrink on. You're going to have to desolder somewhere. So before you make that final connection in your installation, Put the heat shrink on from the joint, slide the heat shrink away from the joint so it doesn't receive heat from the solder. And then once it's cool, or even when it's still a little bit warm, move that heat shrink into place and heat it up. And you can see we now have a good joint and it is covered so it cannot come in contact with any conductors. For the final bit of this video, I'm gonna show you part of my collection. Some of these boards have resistors, capacitors, switches, connectors, the various components that I'll use for installations or won't use. Maybe I'll just use the boards for practice. Um, but I keep these from all of the dead electronics that I have. Um, and you let your friends know if they're gonna throw something out like a laptop, an old television, anything. So you can have it and then take it apart. You can salvage components out of it. Save yourself some money and um, you can have good practice on these things. So what I mean by that is, okay, so after rifling through a few things, you can see that there are various size solder pads on this board. There's a lot of components on it. If you want to practice soldering wire connections, all you have to do is take this board, grab a piece of spare wire, and just like the steps we went through soldering to the board before, you trim it to the size of your pad. Once it's pre-tinned, you will add a little bit of solder to the tip of your iron. You'll come into the pad that you want to make the connection on. And there you have it, a perfectly good way to practice making solder joints on a board. Okay, guys, that is all I've got for you today on soldering. Um, in the future, I will be working on more tutorials that get more in-depth on specific components and installations. But for now, I just wanted to touch on all of those basics because it seems like a lot of people have not reached a level yet where they're comfortable soldering or fully understand what a good clean joint should look like. I hope this helps you guys. Um, I hope it keeps some of your installs a little bit more hassle-free and makes things run a little bit smoother for you. Thanks for watching everybody.